thank you so much and welcome. Thank you for making it here tonight on this really blicky evening. Um, my name is Sylvia Rochelo, and along with my fellow curator and colleague Eric Stark, we share the privilege of curating the New School Art Collection. Um, we are really, truly pleased to present this evening's discussion on food, power, and politics with our distinguished guest speakers, Paul Friedman, Nina Khrusheva, and Fabio Parasecoli, who we'll introduce in a few moments. Um, but I have many thanks for this uh, event and, um, and uh, the greater exhibition. Um, we've been supported uh, for this event, in particular by the New Schools of Public Engagement, the Food Studies Program, Ashok Gurung and the India China Institute, and the Sheila Johnson Design Center. Our talk tonight is one of three events uh, programmed around our current exhibition in the Parsons Aronson Gallery at 66 Fifth Avenue, right down the street. Uh, the exhibition is a multidisciplinary response around a single work from the New School Art Collection, Roxy Payne's Dinner of the Dictators, which the artists created over 20 years ago in 1995, way before food studies were even considered part of a university, university curriculum. Um, Dinner of the Dictators has just returned from a year-long loan uh, in an exhibition in Varese, Italy, and has not been installed on campus uh, in over 10 years. So please go and pay a visit to Aronson Gallery um, and, uh, and enjoy the exhibition. It's really marvelous and unfortunately, well, I promised I wouldn't make any political statements tonight, so I, um, uh, anyway, a bit timely. But uh, the exhibition is up through January 4th. There are two other events I invite you to attend. Um, a film screening of Marco Ferreri's 1973 La Grande Bouffe with a talk by Ramsey McGlazer in collaboration with Lang's visual arts program director, So Young Yoon, on December 5th, um, Monday night at 6 o'clock in Kellen Auditorium, and a conversation between Roxy Payne and art critic Christian Viveros Fon as part of the Parsons MFA Visiting Artist Series on December 7th. Um, and that will happen at 7 o'clock in Kellen Auditorium as well. Um, I'd really like to thank all the contributors to, these, to the exhibition, um, but I won't go through the, the long laundry list, but, but we did want to particularly thank Fabio Parasecoli, who has been our trusty food guide and go-to advisor throughout the course of the exhibition, all while he has been on sabbatical. So thank you so much, Fabio. Our guest speakers, Nina Khrushchev and Paul Friedman, um, who will be properly introduced by Fabio in a few minutes. Radhika Subramaniam, who's not here tonight, the director of the Sheila Johnson Design Center. Um, the creative team of Shibani Jadhav, Chris London, Gamar Markarian, and Sylvia Xavier for their really rich contribution of corporate vortex, which is installed outside of the Aronson Gallery. Uh, Eric Jorgensen, Caitlin Lines, and Ali Maddy, students in Nina Khrushcheva's Medium Politics of Propaganda class, for their recording of A Dinner Conversation, which is an imagined dialogue between dictators. Um, and Lucas, Justinian Perez, and Makushla Robinson, our trusty curatorial assistants and collaborators who keep Eric and I on our toes. Um, and finally, but not least, uh, Pam Tillis and Jessica Hedmeinek, who are the directors of public programming here at the New School. Um, before Fabio comes to the podium to introduce our guest speakers, um, and before I introduce pa Fabio, I just wanted to speak briefly about this room and why we're here tonight and not in Kellen Auditorium. Um, we are in... Um, this is, to frame, to frame the discussion, we thought this room was incredibly appropriate. It is, uh, in many ways, the heart and soul of this institution. We are in Jose Clemente Orozco's 1931 Mexican mural cycle, the only remaining fresco cycle in New York City by a Mexican artist. Um, the only other fresco that exists in New York is uh, Orozco's dive bomber and tank that is at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, it is a call to revolution and table of universal brotherhood. 
Um, we have on the eastern and western walls um, sociopolitical events of the day on the margins of the European centers. So we have Gandhi's nationalism, uh, British imperialism, uh, s different forms of slavery from white collar slavery to African slavery. This was the most topical mural that Orozco ever did. He did three in the United States, one at Pomona, this one here in New York in 1931 at the New School, and then the one at Dartmouth uh, a few years later that has now become uh, a, a national landmark. Um, on the other side of the wall, we have uh, a famous Mexican agrarian land reformer, Carrillo Puerto, and his female leguistas. He believed in the right for women uh, women's right to vote and uh, uh, everyone's uh, right to own land. Um, he was assassinated in the 1920s, but Orozco places him up, up here as a hero. Um, we have Lenin and Stalin and the communist revolution, the Red Guard, um, Stalin and Lenin in the same panels. In the 1950s, uh, Stalin and Lenin were covered by a yellow curtain during the McCarthy period. There was uh, a huge discourse and discussion uh, about whether they this, these murals should continue to exist. People had um, difficulties with them, and so uh, to mitigate any kind of damage, the university at the time, the administration, covered it with a yellow curtain, and we think probably that yellow curtain was up for close to 10 years. Um, two tables in the room, uh, north and south, utopian tables. We have homecoming of the worker of the new day behind us, one of the few sort of uh, utopian murals that Orozco um, places here. Uh, home, hearth, fire, books, all the basic things in life, um, and a landscape beyond with a very, very hopeful, um, positive depiction of um, of what everyone should have in, uh, and has a right to have um, in life. Um, behind us is the table of universal brotherhood, um, where Orozco places uh, different uh, gentlemen, of course, he was a man of his time, um, uh, from intellectuals to s stereotypes of various races across the world, sitting together at a table, convening with an open book, uh, no, it's not um, uh, uh, Das Kapital or, you know, it is an open book, um, really um, a metaphor for the future. And he places two tables within, this was, by the way, the uh, faculty lounge and uh, a, a, basically a space to convene, to eat, and to engage. He places these tables sort of tilted towards the viewer to continue the dialogue and to continue a relational experience with the murals. So I'll stop there because there's plenty to say and I could go on as Eric knows and um, Makushla and, and Lucas do. Um, but, um, but as an extension of the Roxy Payne and that dinner table of the dictators and the desiccated meals that we see in Aronson Gallery uh, we thought this would be a wonderful um, bookend to have this, this discussion tonight. So I'll introduce Fabio, um, who is Fabio Parasecoli, who is uh, Associate Professor and Director of Food Studies Initiatives here at the New School for Public Engagement. Um, last night here um, at the New School, we celebrated with Fabio the launch of his most recent book, to add to his grow growing list of publications. And you can read his bio, and I'm, I'm giving you a very, very abbreviated one because you have these lovely uh, pamphlets, uh, programs, uh, that you can read a more extended bio. Um, he uh, uh, launched uh, the recent book called Feasting Our Eyes, which is co-authored with Laura Lindenfeld, uh, a book that explores food films as they have become markers of identity in US culture. And one of my favorite food films, Big Night, is on the cover. Um, so uh, it's, it looks like a marvelous book. And I look forward to giving it to the uh, timpano party that I'm going to on Saturday to the guests. Um, Fabio has a background in political science and studied in Rome, Naples, and Beijing. He was a journalist covering Middle and Far Eastern politics um, and was the US correspondent for Gambero Rosso 
Italy's prominent food and wine magazine. Fabio's knowledge in food studies is wide ranging from food insecurity, you'll have to explain that to me, to food design. Um, and Fabio is a regular contributor to the Huffington Post, where he's been wonderful in really plugging the exhibition. So thank you very much. And I will, uh, without further ado, I leave it up to you, Fabio. Thank you. So thank you for coming. Um, I'll start just by, first of all, uh, welcoming you all. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, piece for me. I'll, I'll, but before I go into the, the topic, I'd like to introduce the other two panelists. We're very, very happy they are with us. <coughs> Paul Friedman is professor of history at Yale University. He specializes in medieval social history, but as you can see from the bi biography, his interests are much, much wider than that. Uh, he's published uh, very important books in the field of food history, and we use them a lot in, in food studies. Uh, Out of the East, The Spices and the Medieval Imagination, that's a book I use in my class on the food history and of globalization, for instance. Uh, beautiful book on food, the history of taste, and his last book uh, that just came out in September, right? Uh, on 10 Restaurants That Changed America. Uh, on 10 different restaurants and how they represent moments in political and social uh, dynamics in, in our culture. Um, Nina Khrushcheva is here on faculty. We are lucky to have her here. She's professor in the graduate program in international affairs and she's also the associate dean for academic affairs in Milano uh, here at the new school. Um, she studied in Princeton and then she worked for uh, the School of Law at NYU. Um, she publishes in uh, all sorts of uh, media. Here I can mention Newsweek, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. Um, and she is the author of uh, two books, Imagining Nabokov, uh, Russia Between Art and Politics, uh, and then The Lost Khrushchev, a journey into the gulag of the Russian mind. And we are very, very pleased that they accepted to be uh, here with us. So here, if you haven't seen the, the exhibitions, you can see some shots of the table. Uh, it's a very interesting composition. And actually, I, when Sylvia and Eric yes, was it, invited me to collaborate on this project, I started thinking about the different dictators and how they relate to food. Uh, so here we have, uh, I have the list here, otherwise I would not remember, Somoza, Tian Kai-shek, uh, Mussolini, Stalin, uh, Papadoc Duvalier, Hitler, Gengis Khan, Suharto, Haile Selassie, Napoleon, Franco, and Mao Zedong. I think it's very interesting that the artist decides to go back and forth in history. It's not just looking at modern dictatorships, but he's also going back into the past all the way to Genghis Khan. Of course, he could have gone even further back. Think about, I don't know, Roman emperors or Chinese emperors and the role that food had in, in politics. I think this idea of starting from a table is very interesting because it shows how food and politics happens at different levels. It happens sort of a macro level, and then it seeps down into what Foucault used to call the biopolitics. Basically, the control of the individual bodies and of the interactions about individual bodies in, in social groups. So on one side, you have you know, this large historical phenomenon. For instance, uh, Mao Zedong, that's one of the I'm more familiar with since I studied uh, in China for a couple of years. You know, we think pretty much when it's Mao Zedong uh, about the Cultural Revolution. But in fact, Mao Zedong had a very profound impact on the production system of China, especially in agriculture. He started in the 50s with uh, land reforms that basically 
uh, redistributed the land am among uh, farmers. And then towards the late 50s, he created the communes uh, as a way to promote the advancement of China. That turns out to be a, a disaster because basically the production almost screeched to a halt. Uh, and that caused one of the worst uh, famines in the history of humanity uh, around 1661. So there are all these aspects about this historical character that sometimes we don't think uh, about because we're more focused on his uh, sort of political uh, role, uh, his writing, his way of um, making Marxism evolve in a rural society. But as a matter of fact, cer certain decisions impacted very much on not only the life of the everyday Chinese as a people, but the private life. For instance, in the communes, very often, uh, private kitchens were not used. People were supposed to eat together, um, cook together, so that some people could specialize in that, cooking and distributing food, while others would specialize in other, in other roles. That didn't work, because after a while, people want you know, the idea of the home. The private, the private meal. And it took years after uh, the end of the Maoist era uh, to bring back uh, those traditions into the everyday life of, of the Chinese. When I was studying in, in Beijing back in the late 80s, it was just the beginning of you know, farmers' markets where uh, farmers could choose to grow other crops besides those that were uh, requested by the government. So they were supposed to give, I don't know, two tons of cabbage. OK, I'm done with the two tons of cabbage. How can I use my land to do other things? And they started selling at the free market. That meant that people could buy better and more expensive food in markets and start cooking, go back to rediscovering uh, old recipes, traditions. So in a way, it, it, it was a political act going out of the bleak years of the end of the Cultural Revolution and starting rediscovering pleasure in a very simple way. Those restaurants that were opening back in the late 80s were not you know, the restaurants you see now in China. But symbolically and in the way people uh, enjoyed them, they really marked an, an important an important change. So for instance, in this case, you can see how the macro level of the food system and the personal experience and the control the government can have uh, on an individual through food are very much connected. And another example that I would like to mention that I, I also know quite well is uh, Mussolini. I'm from Italy. And uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book on the history of food in Italy. And I spent quite a a lot of time on Mussolini because I didn't know that he also had such a huge impact in the way uh, Italians ate. Actually, he used food as an instrument of propaganda. So the idea is that the land, it's an organic, uh, almost an organic creature that is connected with its people and it nourishes its people through their work. So at a certain point, uh, he decided that Italy had to isolate itself from the global market and should shift towards what was called autarky, basically self-sufficiency. So we don't need to import wheat from other countries. We don't need to import food from other places. We'll grow everything we need, which in Italy is a little complicated because it's very small and we don't have many uh, you know, large pieces of land that we can toy. Uh, so he introduced, uh, for instance, the draining of many marshes between Rome and Naples to increase the quantity of uh, land available. And he decided to launch what he called the Battle of Wheat. So much of the agricultural system had to be geared towards producing more wheat. Why wheat? Because it's very symbolic for Italians. You know, think about pizza, think about pasta, think about bread. Actually, bread had a special place in fascism imaginary. Uh, while I was doing my research, I found a poem 
that he wrote in 1928 that was sort of an ode to bread. And he, children in school were supposed to learn it so that they would learn how to honor bread. And through bread, also honor the land, uh, honor Italy. Um, so once again, also with Mussolini, we see this connection between these big changes, economic changes, uh, the impact he had on the, on the productive structure, but also the way he was trying to use food to really impose uh, fascism in the daily life of, of people. Women were f really, really important for fascism because women were the cooks. They were the ones in charge of nourishing uh, Italians, not only you know generating more Italians, which was very important for the regime, but to to feed them. So they were supposed to be part of this national effort. Uh, during fascism, we have the first uh, cooking magazines in Italy, and they were very much connected with the regime. For instance, there would be recipes that would teach how to cook with less fuel, or how to use leftovers, or maybe the leaves of um, salad that were not uh, too beautiful, but you can still, I don't know, make a soup. Um, and that became even more important during World War II, of course, because there were shortages. So they started publishing special books on how to cook, basically, with nothing. And uh, the way women were called into this patriotic effort, I think it's, it's very interesting. Uh, last thing I, want, uh, thing I want to mention, recently MIT has published a book called Fascist Pigs uh, about techno-scientific organisms. That, I know, the, the title is genius. Uh, <laughs> but it's actually about fascist pigs. So the author looks at how uh, food and science were used in uh, Nazi Germany, uh, fascist Italy, and also in Salazar's Portugal. Both in the, the country themselves and in the colonies, which is also very important. So he looks at how you know, new varieties of wheat, new varieties of pigs uh, were introduced to increase the availability of food, but also to reassert the ownership of the land. And that became very important when it came to colonies, in a way, because you were supposed to uh, make those lands yours even if that meant, you know, kicking the, the natives out, which was very often the case. We know that, for instance, Italians in Ethiopia and did all sorts of uh, atrocities uh, because of that. And uh, the author uses sheep as an example, this um, Karakul sheep, the Astrakhan. They were trying to introduce these sheep in all the colonies, and uh, it's, it's a book that I strongly recommend. But uh, I think what it really um, made me think about, it's really this, this very complicated relationship that can exist from the, the simple choices of what you produce, how to produce them, uh, who produces them, and how they're distributed. Here it's where you know, politics and power become very important because who determines all these dynamics, all these connections, how do you decide how the whole system works? But what's very important then, these choices at the political level are reflected in the daily lives of citizens. And in a way, the control of food and what people ate or not really um, impacted on what uh, individuals experienced as citizens, but also as family members, and we can see that, you know, <coughs> going back from the beginning of humanity, think about the beginning of Sumerian civilization. You know, as soon as we have agriculture and a surplus, we have different layers of society. Suddenly, you know, the, the priests become the leaders and they sort of dictate what ev everybody ate and who would produce what and how. Think about all the sumptuary laws that, for instance, started in, in the Roman Empire. These were laws that dictated that, you know, if you were a noble, you could eat certain things and have parties in a certain way. If you were part of the plebs, you were not allowed to do certain things. And these laws are repeated and they reappear also in the Renaissance. Uh, so, I mean, this connection, 
it's so important that uh, when we were working on this idea of having a, you know, a cultural history of food in six volumes, we decided to have chapters in every volume that really looked at these dynamics of power and how they inflected the food systems and how they uh, conditioned the experience of the individual citizens and their very nature of citizenship. So we we'll continue on these conversations. Uh, I think Paul uh, will will start with his reflection on this connection between uh, food power and politics, looking specifically at dictators and how they ate and and what they ate. Thank you, Fabio. So the exhibit invites us to reflect on official as well as individual persona of these rulers, these men who presided over meals as part of the ceremonial of their office. And the exhibit doesn't make it clear whether these are official meals or private meals. I would say private meals because it describes what they liked. And this takes a lot of research uh, because it's not always clear what their personal preferences were with regard to food for the same reason that food as a subject is both ubiquitous, people eat all the time and have to, uh, and invisible. Um, people uh, are not aware of it. It's not seen as a cultural phenomenon even any more than um, bodily functions of other sorts are. These people d can fall into maybe three categories. So those who had a narrow and conventional range of dishes that they preferred, tending to the modest and the ordinary. Um, Donald Trump actually would be in this category. <laughs> right? He likes steak, he likes cheeseburgers. Um, a second category would be fattists who for reasons of health or some kind of cosmic philosophy limited their diet. And then gourmands who actually took an interest in food. Of the dictators, uh, Franco, or one who's not included in this artwork, Eric Honecker, who ruled East Germany in the 1980s, they enjoyed food, but only a small number of dishes, and so they repeated a dossier of a certain number of dishes repeatedly. Eggs and chorizo were a favorite of Franco's, although in the exhibit he's, he's uh, served uh, river salmon, I think. Honecker liked macaroni with tomato sauce uh, and schnitzel with potatoes, the latter always taken with a vegetable medley, but apparently the vegetable medley only for health reasons. He actually despised vegetables. His very favorite dish was kassler, uh, a kind of smoked pork dish that the East German nostalgia industry has kind of made retrospectively the national dish of East Germany, served with sauerkraut or potatoes. Hitler is famous as a vegetarian, but actually he was more of a uh, flexitarian. He had a version of Aryan health teachings uh, whereby he considered vegetables to be pure and meat corrupt. Nevertheless, he sometimes ate meat, such as ham, on public occasions, so as not to appear to be unmasculine or insufficiently uh, folkish, uh, people-oriented. The famous English chef and television cooking pioneer, Dione Lucas, claimed that at the Hamburg Hotel, where she cooked in the late 1930s, and where Hitler was a frequent guest, he usually ordered stuffed squab. And uh, apparently liver dumplings were another favorite of his that he was reluctant to give up, even to his dietetic commercial theories. I'm very interested in a meeting that Hitler had, the one meeting he had with Francisco Franco, which was at Andai on the French-Spanish border. They both came by train, and they had a couple meals together in uh, uh, first in Franco's rail car uh, dining room and then in Hitler's. I've never seen a menu 
and I'd be very interested to know if anybody has any information about that. Mussolini suffered from gastric problems, uh, among other things, uh, uh, and um, the medical opinion of the time prescribed a bland diet, what's called mangiare in bianco, I, I believe. Milk, plain pasta, other white foods that in fact uh, exacerbated the disease. Now we would recommend uh, more fiber. Stalin, on the other hand, was enough of a gourmand, especially as he grew older, uh, to order elaborate banquets of Georgian food, especially when he was in his Crimean residence. He often ate in peasant style, combining two soups together, for example, and then crumbling bread into them. But he served caviar, suckling pig, game, and an intimidating amount of alcohol, which had to be consumed uh, with dozens of toasts punctuating every dinner. Stalin had an image of universal genius. That is, he was a great gardener. Uh, he was the friend of children. Uh, he was the great engineer. And so he invented a dish uh, called, that he named Aragvi, after a river in Georgia. This is a dish that involves mutton, eggplant, tomatoes, um, potatoes, and black pepper. From 1940 until the end of the Soviet era, the fanciest restaurant in Moscow was the Aragvi. Stalin made Georgian food a kind of pan-Soviet gourmet cuisine, much as French food was the standard prestigious style of the West and the Russia of the Tsarist period. Mao was less interested in presenting a high-end fantasy cuisine, but he did have a number of favorite dishes, especially from his native Hunan, often very highly spiced. Fuchsia Dunlop, uh, among others, has described the revolutionary food of Mao's homeland. She has a cookbook of Hunan dishes. Mao's favorite dish, supposedly, was red braised pork. So these 20th century dictators had specific tastes in food, but unlike other heads of state, they had to conform to a certain kind of gastronomic protocol on public occasions. The degree of conformity depended on how secretive the dictator was. So um, Mao had relatively few international visitors, which made the banquets during Nixon's visit in 1972 all the more dramatic even though the actual menus were quite modest. Eight treasures duck, roast duck, duck bone soup. Stalin was certainly secretive and paranoid, but he liked entertaining, or, or rather he certainly liked bullying his close associates at meals. And even in the autumn of 1941, as the Germans raced towards Moscow, Stalin held a banquet in the Kremlin for the American uh, envoy Averill Harriman and the British newspaper mogul Lord Beaverbrook, um, a meal that featured huge quantities of caviar and game. More often, dictators served important guests a combination of international French cuisine or national dishes prepared in a more or less international French manner. And, and this actually goes for non-dictators. White House menus of the post-war era exemplify this as well. I, I'd just like to focus on some East German menus state dinner menus that are, uh, some of them are at the Venda Museum in Los Angeles, which is a museum of East German material culture, and some of them are from a book that came out in the sort of 1990s satire cum nostalgia industry for the former East Germany. This book was called Essen wie Erich, uh, Eating Like Eric, Eric Honecker, that is. So, um, uh, in SNV Eric, we have a June 1972 dinner as the earliest one for Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko, and then a kind of Belshazzar's feast on October 7th, 1989, in honor of the 40th anniversary of the founding of the German Democratic Republic, a couple months before its end, as it turned out. And this event was attended by Mikhail Gorbachev, Daniel Ortega, Yasser Arafat, and Nikolai Ceausescu, uh, many of them. Uh, dictators in their own right. The visits of foreign leaders conformed, uh, confirmed the coming of age of the German Democratic Republic after more than two decades of isolation. That is, as a result of West German Chancellor Willy Brandt's Ostpolitik, the idea of two German states was accepted in 1973. The United Nations admitted both Germanys. And so these official meals served as opportunities to demonstrate East German political and cultural integrity. 
And so the menus reflect a kind of national accomplishment and a muted ostentation. Muted because it's a workers and peasants republic. The dinners consisted of four courses. They reflected a cautious sophistication, something between ordinary East German specialties and international tastes. So um, hors d'oeuvres, soup, main course, dessert. The hors d'oeuvres uh, were accompanied by East German vodka or a form of schnapps called Nordhäuser Feiner Alter Korn. The wines were mostly from the two small recognized East German wine regions. The former East Germany, or the former West Germany had 95% of all the wine suitable regions. But these two little regions, Zala Unstrut and uh, a tiny Saxon terroir near Meissen. Occasionally dessert was accompanied by sparkling wine, <laughs> crypto champagne called Zekt. Often the Rotkäppchen label, a celebratory beverage that is also, like Kostler, identified with nostalgia for East Germany. Yes, it was terrible, but we enjoyed it so much at the time. And then brandy, uh, East German brandy, served with coffee after the meal. There was a curious assortment of guests in the Vendor Museum collection and in SNV Erich. Uh, dinners for Daniel Ortega of Nicaragua, Javier Perez de Cuellar, the Secretary General of the UN, Andreas Pompadreo, the Prime Minister of Greece, Tarek Aziz, the Iraqi Foreign Minister, um, Castro, uh, Todor Zhukov of Bulgaria, Janos Kadar of Hungary, and also from soi disant people's democracies in the third world, from Yemen, Laos, Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, so there's not a whole lot of variety in the style of these menus. The hors d'oeuvres often involve toast, so crab cocktail on toast, um, or soup, oxtail soup, beef soup, curried chicken, then a hearty meat course, and then followed by some sort of sweet cream dessert. One assumes that political leaders, dictators or not, are accustomed to official banquets and bored by their offerings. This must be tedious. But still, what, what would Andreas Papandreou, the prime minister of Greece, have made of, uh, in a 1988 meal, Kalbsrocken mit Winderspitzel, no, Winderspitzelzunge, saddle of veal with cured ox tongue, served in burgundy sauce, accompanied by Brussels sprouts, asparagus, which must have been canned or frozen given the uh, fact that the meal took place in January, uh, carrots and potatoes, preceded by stuffed pork tenderloin with piquant anise sauce served with toast and rose-shaped butter and double-strength beef tea with quail eggs. Dessert was orange mousse with chocolate cream. Uh, of course, actually, this, he had visited earlier. Uh, another menu from an earlier visit featured beef broth, this time with liver dumplings and stuffed pork fillet and cream sauce. In June 1984, Daniel Ortega of Nicaragua was served a slightly lighter meal, beginning with what is translated into the Spanish version of the menu as merely a little veal salad with toasts and saladilla de ternera tostados, which misses the all-important adjective in the German Picanter, Picanter Kalbfleisch Salat, toast. Like many bland cuisines, in including American, picant is used frequently in recipes. This was served with Nordhäuser Feiner Alter Korn, this kind of whiskey like uh, preparation. Uh, the soup here was again double. Um, double beef uh, broth given in Spanish simply as consomme, this time without the quail's egg. Chicken fried in spicy egg butter with mushrooms, peas, grilled tomatoes, and potato croquettes constituted the main course, and the meal finished with lemon cream and sour cherries. Uh, Meissen or Weisburgunder was served with the main course, uh, Rotkäppchen Zek with the dessert, and a brandy called Grand Reserve uh, from uh, Wilton in East Germany with the coffee. So I could go on. I don't know if this makes you hungry or uh, maybe not. Uh, the taste is German. These are dishes that Honecker himself uh, certainly liked. There's no fish, for example, something that Honecker uh, uh, really didn't like, except sometimes for herring. It is the rather mediocre 
uh, taste of dictators. One doesn't know whether one wants the dictators to have picturesque tastes, like some of these people do, or uh, mediocre tastes, and part of it depends on whether you think that the accident of history elevates mediocrities to positions of absolute power, which they turn out to be incredibly talented at using, talented at least in the sense of their own survival, or whether you think that food exemplifies a kind of will to power or paranoid character. And I suppose that's the central mystery that this exhibit evokes. Thanks very much. On that note, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm going to continue with. So thank you so much for this, uh, which comes first dictator or his food or her food. Uh, Germany has been represented maybe because we, I don't know much about their food but certainly they have politics and they certainly had dictatorships. So um, there was a great book by Henrik Bill, a 20th century German writer whose novel Billiard uh, at half past nine was an important kind of window into how personalities are created. So he describes a character in, in that book who concocted a very unusual breakfast, which was red peppered soft cheese to create an important and distinguished persona. So that character, a uh, female from a random person quickly turned into a personality that is an architect commanding the great respect. Uh, for me, that is very important in representation how personalities are created. And a lot of it is created through food. James Bond, he's not really a dictator, but let's talk about James Bond. He's important here. Um, those of you who follow James Bond, I certainly do. What is his most important meal? Anybody remembers? Pardon me? Well, he has a meal, actually, in which he, he has a meal. It's breakfast. So that is a very personal meal. You don't share with anybody. You just eat what you think you eat. But of course, that being James Bond, it's not a simple meal. It has to be a special sort of boiled egg, which he boils, or somebody boils for him for three and I think one quarter of minutes. And then there is a special coffee, and there is a singular toast, and so on. And so for me, these are the alpha males. Uh, or females for that matter, and that's how their personalities are created. The special, they're unlike anyone else. Uh, so here we talk about the dinner of the dictators, uh, and they're on display, and I find it actually very interesting there are 12 of them, so it's their last supper, <laughs> being dictators and all. But uh, my interest is very much like Roxy Payne's, it goes across centuries and generations and sort of dick qualities, so to speak. They don't necessarily have to be dictators in our understanding of it that is um, autocratic and absolute power, there's a, a lot of them are just alpha male personalities and James Bond certainly fit into this. Um, they could be males or females. I mean, you know, there are many females. One of the most known ones is Margaret Thatcher. Um, and you remember her iron balls, so she certainly makes a dick. Um, they could be CEOs, super spies, uh, president-elects, AKA Donald Trump for that matter. Uh, and uh, in the exhibit, uh, my students and I actually made up a conversation of what uh, those dictators may be talking at dinner. And of course, our dictators or these dictators, what do they think? What do you think they talk about? Donald Trump, because they believe it's their legacy, or he is their legacy. Uh, so dictatorships, as we know, all about control. And I think Paul was just talking about it. Uh, in terms of food, but it's also a lot about symbolism of leadership. So democracy usually is based on protocol. Uh, state dinners are very protocol uh, formulated, but it's so institution of leadership and how it's represented. Dictatorships are all about rituals. So it is the formulas that you create and you stand up and that's how you build up your power. Food is this kind of ritual, uh, represents the personality of the leader and that to your uh, final uh, statement poll, uh, and it defines his or her personality as well. So I kind of have a few examples here, because at the dinner table, or breakfast table, I guess for that matter, that's not me, um, us 
at the, those tables are the most vulnerable. Uh, that's where we are human because we chew, and you know, dictators are certainly don't chew. Uh, we swallow, we leave refuse, and dictators are supposed to be this very monolithic, look at them, especially them, monolithic figures. Um, at the table, we discuss things that we wouldn't discuss maybe elsewhere. We talk about world affairs and food sort of makes it warmer and conversational. In the Soviet Union that um, Paul was talking about, sort of one of the, um, and you know, of course, the Soviet Union, and I am a former Soviet, so there was a succession of dicks in the Kremlin, uh, but there was a privacy of the kitchen table, and at that private table, these are the only time when the expressions were possible, and food made it possible, whatever, the food, whatever food was available. Um, for the leaders, the state dinner, Paul was talking about it as well, it is very important, and he gave excellent examples, a wonderful example is, of how the state dinners are, created, who they invite, who they serve for those invitations. Uh, so for example, um, when Nikita Khrushchev invited uh, Mao Zedong, it would be one sort of meal when he would invite um, uh, Fidel Castro. Uh, late Fidel Castro would be another uh, kind of meal. Uh, Joseph Stalin uh, had lavish dinners deep into the night. I'm not going to describe his uh, his food because it was already very well described. But it was interesting because there was always a combination of Georgian food and the Russian food because the message of that would be that he, a Georgian, ruled over the Soviet empire as a Russian. And that was a very important propaganda political messages. Um, one of the, my favorite dicks, some of you know, is Dick Cheney. I think he just completely, um, uh, cannot be uh, underestimated as a major dick. Um, former U.S. Vice President, and of course he fits into dictatorial tradition by virtue, just by virtue of unilateral decisions that he made. We all know those. Um, um, I can share with you that what he loved uh, is a very interesting um, uh, place. That is Panera Bread. Talking about the importance of bread, that is his favorite place where he wants to take his food. And it is very interesting because I actually think food does define those people. So like him, it's sort of pretending to be pure, but in truth, a chain with an empty heart. Uh, very Dick Cheney. Vladimir Putin, my man, you know, I, my people are very important to me. Like James, like, like James Bond, or anti-James Bond villain, depending on how you look at, uh, at Putin's greatness or non-greatness. Um, Loves his breakfast, like James Bond, very interesting. Porridge, honey, cottage cheese, all of excellent, like James Bond, excellent, excellent quality. He's a big health food eater, also important because, you know, he's a judo man, um, does all this thing, so it's very important to give, get that message. Veg vegetables, fish, um, but what betrays his humanity which sometimes he hides, sometimes he opens up, depending on the audience that he is presenting himself to, is ice cream. He loves ice cream. Like all Soviets, he loves ice cream. That was our thing uh, in the Soviet Union in 10 degree Fahrenheit weather, everybody would be eating ice cream. And there was a sign of defiance, sort of in the cold Russian climate, political or otherwise, we are gonna have that ice cream. So he does that. And interestingly enough, Fidel Castro loves ice cream, you know, being bred by my people. Um, so he is a great lover of ice cream, and in fact, a great lover of all products with milk. And, in and at some point, milk somehow represented, or milk products represented this great level of revolution on Cu of Cuba that it could compete with French camembert. Um, and whatnot. So these this things are kind of important um, definitions of, of, um, um, of, of those dicks. Um, and uh, um, a lot of them, I mean, we probably, this food was tasted by many food tasters because all of them probably had, had those. Uh, Putin has many, many food tasters uh, still. Um, Erdogan, the president of Turkey, has numerous, numerous, um, uh, because he's afraid that somebody is going to poison him. Uh, and something also very important uh, about Putin and, and all dictators or, or dicks, for, for that matter, is that they can have, I mean, this food represents 
something that they have and others, and others cannot. Uh, you know, there are sanctions, Western sanctions against Russia for uh, Russia's involvement in Ukraine. So Western foods are forbidden. I mean, this is a, uh, they cannot be imported. And yet every morning, if you park yourself, and I did one morning, if you park yourself next to uh, Putin's estate, you can see that the trucks from Norway with Norwegian salmon or trucks from Holland with uh, Dutch cheese are actually being parked there and... Uh, this is what being con consumed by Putin himself, while the rest of people have sort of the replacement of. And um, you know, when Paul talked about Stalin and Stalin's times, interestingly enough, I mean, it was not um, food happy time. It wasn't happy time in anything, but for food, there was really not much to choose from. And yet, uh, in um, 1940s. Um, 1930s and then 1940s was printed, came out a beautiful book, which was called uh, The Book of Healthy and uh, Tasty Food. And the pictures there were, I don't even know how they made them, probably some sort of makeup. Uh, and the recipes of pear partridges and things that the Soviets never even heard of, unless they read Russian literature. Uh, and yet that was sort of a propaganda piece is to say, well, you don't have it in the table, but you can read a book, um, which is as good as, 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 the, real, as the real food. Um, so Margaret Thatcher, as I said, I promised Margaret Thatcher, so she's important, once again, defined by her love of, guess what, hard-boiled eggs. Uh, that's um, very important, the iron, iron lady uh, with those eggs, uh, which really fittingly gave her stamina. Richard Nixon was mentioned here, um, another really good dick. Um, once he was a petty clerk from California and uh, his favorite food was ketchup, as American as apple pie. And he smeared it on absolutely everything. Uh, one of my favorite men was uh, Idi Amin of Uganda, um, remember six feet four, uh, last king of Scotland, so he loved all things brutish, but he also loved all things British. So there was um, uh, crocodile stew and roast goat, but also British fancy afternoon tea, which was also something that he loved. He also, he was a military man, and as a military man, he loved KFC sort of a homage to Colonel Sanders. Um, our new Dick, I know you said you're not gonna mention, but you know, Dicks are my life. Politics and their tricks are my life. Uh, Donald Trump, Trump steaks, Trump taco bowl, also incredibly representative, you know, because as he knows the hombres, as he put it, uh, and uh, uh, shows that he knows other cultures, um, uh, and basically that is, I think, is as symbolic as his sort of reality TV leadership uh, that uh, he promises to deliver. Um, so, I mean, there are other interesting indicators about how dicks are created, but I'm not going to go into this. Um, their fashion, their sports. Um, for us, I think today is important that uh, it is food that really stands in the center of it and, and uh, um, they create this symbolism of their existence through food choices. And I think the uh, dinner of the dictators really represent that. Uh, Paul said it is a personal choice, but it's also political choice because politically that's how these countries would be represented uh, on, on the table. Thank you very much. So we'll be taking questions from here. Uh, you will ask your question, we'll repeat them in the microphone, so uh, they will be taped. Uh, actually, let me take this out so we can share it. Or maybe not. I have a question, <laughs> actually, if I may. Um, to both of you, since you're food experts, when you, uh, when you talked about um, choice of food for those who have dietary restrictions and by being 
dictators, how could they reconcile it with their politics? Because they're supposed to look masculine, they're supposed not to have any elements, and supposed to be always sort of high up in the, in the sky, so to speak. Well, um, I think what you said about Putin is apposite, because there it's tough guy food. So it's perfectly good to have a fussy diet that would be what an athlete in training might eat. Mm -hmm. What um, worried Hitler and his entourage was vegetarianism as a fad is not only not really very masculine in the context, but is not very German since it's a meat-eating people. So the folkish part, that you're not really uh, a man of the people. And so that's more like a persistent American problem. Uh, you'll remember the Bush-Kerry election in which Kerry's knowledge of French was very right. quickly right. carried over into a supposed it's love of gourmet right. food as opposed to, uh, you know, the actual equally wealthy um, Jeb Bush's, uh, uh, um, George W. Bush's fondness for pork rinds, alleged fondness for pork rinds. And in fact, this goes back to, a 19, to the 19th century. There are elections like that between uh, Van Buren, who was of modest origin, and uh, it's one of the Harrisons, uh, William Henry Harrison or Benjamin Harrison, the one who lived only a month or two in office once he was elected. But he beat Van Buren partly by posing as a man who liked raw beef and cider, whereas Van Buren, um, drank soup a, a, a la reine uh, out of a silver goblet with a golden spoon and liked pate as well. So the notion of um, food inappropriate for rulers includes faddishness, fussiness, and um, uh, gourmandise. And so while uh, the Kennedy White House could get away with uh, fine food. That's really a brief interval. Nixon made sure that people knew that he liked ketchup and cottage cheese. And um, so the, the, um, the symbolism of food, even uh, in relatively non-dictatorial regimes, has some of the same overtones uh, as we're talking about. I, I was thinking about um, the, the political campaign before the election and how both candidates uh, very often were um, filmed or gave interviews in diners or sort of fast food joints as a sign of being part of the people. But while they were sort of representing their presence there, very rarely you can actually see them eat. Actually, I was listening to a podcast that pointed out how the actual fact of eating bring them down to, you know, just a normal human being. And very often when you eat, you can have strange expressions. And of course, there would be some photographer that would take him, you know, with this, a weird face while eating, I don't know, ice cream or um, a hot dog. And so they are very careful of doing the performance of sharing food with the people, but never to be seen uh, while, while eating, which I find uh, very interesting. So the act of actual ingestion is not part of the political language, but what you show you like uh, is. And, and this goes back, you know, uh, as I said, I'm more familiar with the uh, history of, of Mussolini. Uh, while he was in power, there was this, um, artistic uh, movement, futurism, that you might be uh, aware of, of course. Uh, but what you might not know, that futurism worked on cooking too. They have a futurist cooking book, uh, which is incredible because you have these artists, males, that clearly have no idea about how to cook and what food is and how it's made. But they wanted to use food to represent heroism and technology and velocity, all these elements. And they created um, very interesting dinners that were more performances than actual, actual dinners. And they were supporters of Mussolini and fascism. But at the same time, 
Mussolini never participated in those dinners because that would have put him in this creative sort of elite <coughs> situation and he did not want to be represented like that. So in a way he appreciated the support and the propaganda that, uh, that the futurists were doing for him also through food, but he didn't want to participate because again, you know, you, he would not be somebody of, of the people, these were crazy artists, lots of weird things happened during those dinners, he didn't want to get mixed up with that. They wanted to eradicate pasta, right? So they wanted to eradicate pasta because pasta was responsible of sluggish, of laziness, and that's why Italy is a backward country, we have to get rid of that. Their meals were crazy, I, I mean, I participated in a couple of dinners uh, inspired by the Futurist cookbook, and there was a dish, and we had to do that, where we were supposed to chew on meat and sound, uh, play sort of the battle trumpet while uh, perfume was poured on us. And that was actually the performance that happened back in the 30s. Try to uh, play a trumpet while chewing on meat. You know, but uh, that didn't matter because that was the, the, the sign of the heroism, the warrior, the, the battle even around, around the table. And that, that, that was, I think, one of the most interesting cases of this sort of contradictions between you know, the dictators and powers and then um, you know, what people ate. Of course, all Italians were already during autarky and very often didn't have much to eat, so these dinners were also criticized because of that. So uh, the question is about the, the connection of the performance of, of power eating certain things and the way these dictators of politicians in general actually uh, implement policy. Is there any connection? Um, I'll start and then I'll, I'll pass it on. I don't think so. There, those are actually two different dimensions. One is performance and the other one is the nitty gritty of politics. Nobody wants to be bogged down with the discussions about the farm bill. Right? That's not sexy. When you're on campaign or when you're at, at the state dinner, that's not what you want to talk about or, you know, the, uh, the Child Care Act. So I think, basically, I would say no. I mean, it's, it's sort of like two different dimensions. They are just connected by this, these individuals. But the, the reality of food production, of policy, of, you know, making sausage, uh, politically, are kept on the side, sort of hidden. I would actually disagree, if I may. Oh. Uh, that was something I was trying to, to, to say, is that um, especially in dictatorships, I think, yes, when we talk about sort of certain Americanism and eating a corn dog or an apple pie or a driller, um, in 2008, if I remember, uh, Hillary Clinton was saying, well, I can have a drink, and Barack Obama may not be able to have a drink. Um, therefore, I'm more woman of the people. Uh, I think that in dictatorships particularly, these things are also creations. I mean, they choose what they want to push forward. Uh, and, that's, and that builds the personality. And so I think they're not entirely divorced because um, Idi Amin decides that he's going to like something for the purposes of also putting it forward as a representative or he likes something and then says, well, everybody likes that. And Paul was talking about Stalin and Georgian cuisine, uh, which Stalin was not, only li was not only liking, but also promoting as um, sort of a showing that, uh, that Georgia has a, st has, has a place in um, the Soviet imperial imperial stage, so I don't think they can be entirely divorced. I think a lot of those personal tastes then become um, a national agenda, so to speak. Um, Putin, I mean, Russians always liked ice cream. Now when Putin, in fact, after certain events comes and buys a piece of ice cream, it's like, oh, he's a man of the people, now we all like pistachio ice cream. So I think, I think this, um, in some ways it's personal, but also for dictators particularly, it becomes incredibly political. So the question is about the connection in the U.S. society between the increases in, in increasing inequalities and what people, we don't have, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what people actually eat 
uh, what they are able to eat, what they have access to, and also in terms of health, right? One of the interesting things, though, is that this shifts and is not completely related to inequality as such, or it's related to inequality, but not to the recent increase in inequality. So I spent the first part of my academic career in the South from 1979 to 1997. And um, when I lived in Nashville, Tennessee, for most of that time, the stereotype that well-off people had of poor people, uh, which would be sort of country people, was that they kept chickens in their backyard, they grew their own food, they canned it or put it in jars up for the winter, they pickled a lot of stuff, all of which was regarded as rather amusing, as opposed to the sophisticated tastes of wealthy people who were fond of imported goods, things like shortbread cookies from Scotland or pate in cans from France. And now, in some respects, the situation is reversed. That is, if rich people don't have chickens in their backyards, they certainly are fussing about where their chickens come from. And the freshness of their food, the, you know, Brooklyn has more pickling than uh, probably the South ever did when I lived there. Whereas now poor people are stereotyped, you know, the Jamie Oliver uh, show from Parkersburg, West Virginia, is it? You know, the place that has the highest rate of obesity. And of course, well, these people are just uneducated. They, they, they eat fast food all the time. Uh, uh, and these, of course, are the same people who, uh, you know, had chickens in their backyard 30 years ago. I'll just close with uh, one observation <clears throat> apropos of uh, uh, politicians not eating not liking to be shown actually eating food. Um, I always tell my graduate students as a paraphrase of Nelson Algren's famous, never eat at a place called Mom's, never play cards with a man named Doc, and his original third advice for living uh, addressed to males was never take up with a woman who's seen more trouble than you have. But my version is never order pasta at your interview dinner. If you go for an interview, um, my recommendation is salmon. If, and particularly in the academic world, you have interviews that feature dinners. So that you, know, you stay at a place for a couple of days, and they uh, take you to dinner, and they're asking you all these questions. And first of all, of course, pasta, assuming it has something on it, is going to create opportunities for um, the kind of messiness that politicians want to avoid. Um, but even steak takes a lot of work to eat, and so you need something that you can eat while answering questions, and that requires no, you know, that sort of falls apart easily. So that's, that's my advice, a parting advice on how to live your life. That's Putin for you, Norwegian salmon. There it is. Yeah. I think in, in, the, in the case of Italy, it was not so much between production and Mussolini, but Italians and production. Because, of course, you know, at a certain point there was less food, Italians had less to eat, and so the whole system started to think, okay, how can we justify that? And so there were scientists and nutritionists saying, no, these are part of a different race, they are Mediterraneans, and so they don't need as much food, for instance, as the British or the French. We, they can survive with less. And so they had an excuse to sort of justify the fact that, you know, these changes in production were not uh, granting enough food for, for everybody. So there is this sort of dynamics, but I think it, it's sort of a triangulation between the power at Mussolini, but also, you know, the people working in propaganda, the people working in the uh, agricultural ministry, the people and the production sector. And, and there was a sort, of course, it becomes then a loop that, in, in the case of Italy, it became worse and worse and worse until, until the war, and then everything crumbled. I think that's a tough one. I think it's going to have a, s a symbolic impact, of course, because it, it means, you know, we are not really working towards, I don't know, more localized food systems or uh, urban agriculture or uh, small farm production, um, which depending on, you know, it's not only Trump is the whole Congress that now has a, a certain majority, and so the choices uh, that will affect, for instance, the farm bill 
or the new rules about um, assistance to to the poor or to food for children, I think that will become the real uh, crux of what happens in our food system. What happens in in, in the garden if it if it's taken out, it's going to be sort of symbolic of all the big systemic changes that Chris was mentioning. You know, this vortex uh, where we're we're sucked in. We'll see what happens. Also, who's going to be the next chef in the White House? I mean, what will that represent uh, symbolically? Uh, in terms of the choices. But again, you know, it's not just the president. When it comes to food policy, it's much, the decisions are much more diffused um, with politicians, with corporations, with lobbying, and that's gonna be very interesting to observe in the next, in the next few years, I think. Observe, interesting and scary. Right? That's my take. All right, so you wanna, Thank you very much, Fabio, Nina, Paul, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Go see the exhibition. Um, I think we have the lunch of the academics <laughs> next. That would be a really good one. Um, but thanks for coming out tonight and really, really appreciate this really wonderful panel. Um, have a great night, y'all.